Today is my birthday, <laughs> and it's been an amazing 43 years, mostly. But even though it's my birthday, I want to talk about my baby's birthday, which is the day that I thought I was going to die. I was in labor, and all of a sudden, all the alarms went off in the room. The medical staff rushed in from every way, and my physician told me that I had to have an emergency C-section. As I was lying on the operation table, I remember how scared I felt. I remember that I could not breathe, and I literally thought the life was draining out of my body. And faced with that realization, the only thing that I thought was, at least I have life insurance so that my daughter will be taken care of financially. But thank God, I survived. And I get to be here for my daughter. But the sad reality is that black mothers are nearly three times as likely to die for pregnancy-related causes than white mothers. Now, as a health equity researcher, I know that income is typically a protective factor. And so the more money people have, typically as a group, the healthier that they are based on resources and other things of that nature. But you don't find this in maternal health. In fact, there was a recent study that showed that the wealthiest black mothers were more likely to die in childbirth than the poorest white mothers. You might ask yourself, why is this the case? Well, there's many studies that show that racism is in our social environment, and it really breaks down black women's health. You think about this chronic stress that builds up in the body, and it manifests into things like high blood pressure or preeclampsia, all things that, are, that can be deadly. So unfortunately, these health disparities are nothing new. So I want to talk to you about this gentleman. He provided health care and wanted to provide health care for black people, and especially black women. His name is T.J. Huddleston Sr., and he is my great-grandfather. He was born in 1876, which was the same year that the U.S. was celebrating its centennial. He was a prominent business owner and had 18 funeral homes across the state of Mississippi. Being in that position, many times he saw a lot of premature and preventable deaths. And in the Jim Crow South, black people were not allowed to get the medical care they needed. It was abysmal if they could get any medical care at all. So, he wanted to make sure he could provide that. In 1924, he founded the Afro-American Sons and Daughters, which was an organization that focused on insurance and medical care. So through that organization, members paid 50 cents, and membership rose to over 35,000 people. And in fact, it's one of the world's, well, one of the U.S.'s first HMOs, health maintenance organizations. But you know what? He didn't stop there. He saw the injustices all around, and he wanted to do more. And black women were his catalyst to wanting to start a hospital. Look at the words of what my grandfather said, my great-grandfather. He said, I'm tired of our women having babies in cotton fields. We need to build us a hospital. Give me a dollar for a brick, and I'll build us a hospital. Now, this quote, it really, really like strikes me because I remember having my daughter. I remember my traumatic birth experience. If I had been born back then, and I had to have my daughter in a cotton field, I might have died. But with the persistence of my great-grandfather going door to door and getting those dollars. Four years later, 
1928, the Afro-American Hospital of Yazoo City, Mississippi was built. It is the first hospital that was owned by black people for black people in Mississippi, and it made an incredible difference. For instance, the um, people died less in this hospital than any other hospital in the South in that time period if you were a black person. This made such an incredible difference that in 2006, it was listed as a historic site. But I have to tell you something. Something that I think is extra special about this hospital is that my grandmother had my mom there. So this is such a triumph. But if I think about today, today there are still black women who are dying in childbirth and their babies are having adverse health outcomes. It's like that racism has moved from the cotton field to the cloud, the data cloud. Let me explain. So my Harvard classmate, Dr. Tu Nguyen, did this study. It's called the Association Between State-Level Racial Attitudes Assessed from Twitter Data and Adverse Birth Outcomes. Now, what I want to point out, this is a picture of my husband, Damon, and I as we're waiting on the arrival of our beautiful sage. And the reason it's important to have a picture is so that people know when you're using data, that literally represents real people. So let me tell you about this study. It was an innovative study. It used 26 million tweets to measure how people were talking about race and ethnicity on Twitter. So it was used as a proxy. And then they compared by state the level dealing with different birth outcomes. So let's get into the details. This is the geographic distribution of negative sentiment tweets using race-related terms. So the darker the color is within the state, that represents that there are more tweets that have a negative sentiment or negative talk that include terms with race and ethnicity. So as we look at these states, let's see how they're connected with birth outcomes. So here, if you look at the total population of mothers, mothers living in states with the highest level of negative talk related to race and ethnicity actually had 8% greater incidence of low birth weight babies and preterm birth. Both of those things are connected to health outcomes that can have ramifications throughout someone's entire life. Now, they also looked specifically at mothers of color, and they saw that those discrepancies were even greater. So, mothers of color who live in states with high levels of tweets where people are talking negatively with terms of race and ethnicity have a 13% greater incidence of low birth weight and 10% greater incidence of preterm birth. But something that I found fascinating as well, they looked just at white mothers. And when they looked specifically at white mothers, they also saw that if they were in a state with high levels of tweets that were talking negatively with terms related to race and ethnicity, they still had an 8% greater incidence of low birth weight and preterm birth compared if they were a white mother living in a state with low levels of people talking negatively about race and ethnicity. So, after I read this study, I knew that I wanted to work with this research team. So together with other researchers from across the country, we founded Big Data for Health Equity to continue doing this type of work. And our work has been funded over $3.3 million to find ways to measure racism and have evidence-based solutions to address it. So my first study with the research team was Pride, Love, and Twitter Rants, what our tweets reveal about race in the US. And what I brought to the team was qualitative analysis. So we were using machine learning to look at millions of tweets to see if it was positive or negative. But I want to know, now, what are they actually saying? And so we got more in detail with our research. 
And since this paper, our team has published seven more papers together. So we are actively working and actively trying to address this. Now, one paper that we did recently was looking at racism during pregnancy and birthing experiences. And we talked to women across the United States, specifically Asian and Pacific Islander, Black, Latina, and Middle Eastern women. And we thought it was important that we hear directly from them. We want to move from the data cloud directly to hear people's voices. And what they said is there's still discrimination. They saw that there was discrimination in society and on the examination table. They said they wanted more support with their pregnancy and birthing experiences and talked about having a doula, which is someone there with the mother to advocate for her while she is having a baby. And actually studies show that really makes a huge impact in the health of the mother and the baby. They wanted diverse representation for key decision makers along with people who work in the field. They wanted a change. And I think that's something that we all should want. But the question is, how can we solve this problem? Well, there is no easy solution, but we can do a lot of little things to make a big difference. We can continue doing this type of research and amplify the data and then use it to find solutions. We can communicate with our legislators, our decision makers, and our public health people so we can have an equitable society for everyone, including in our healthcare sector. We can partner with community members, like my great-grandfather did, brick by brick by brick, to build a hospital so that we can continue to build a system that works as it should for every single person. Then everyone, like me and like my daughter, can have the same opportunity for a happy birthday.